Remember that we were discussing the last time equilibrium SIR model with demography. By demography, I mean that first of all, I scaled it so that S plus I plus R equal to 1 divided by the total number in the population. So, with these are equations for the susceptible infected and recovered fraction. The first term mu reflects the births into the population and that birth because it normally should be mu times n, a fraction of the total size, but since I scaled n out, n does not appear explicitly. So, all of these are what were earlier called small i, small s, small r, but that should not confuse you. Once I have told you that s plus i plus r equal to 1. Both these definitions are used interchangeably in the literature. So, these are a set of differential equations, ordinary differential equations that are nonlinear and are coupled. So, the s and i are coupled to each other, the r is coupled to the i equation. So, they must be solved together. You cannot solve these problems independently. However, there is a constraint that s plus i plus r equal to 1. So, only two of these equations are really independent and the third follows automatically once you solve the first two. Mm -hmm. So, from here we found that the critical value of r naught, there was a certain number which is proportional to the ratio of two quantities that appeared in this equation, a beta and a gamma plus mu. And if r naught was greater than 1, then the disease would propagate in the population, it would increase. If r naught was less than 1, then the disease would die out. Mm -hmm. And we can understand many of the properties of what happens at long times in these, in these equations, which are sort of independent of how you started them off. And that is by setting all the time derivatives on the left hand side equal to 0. That means s, i and r do not change in time anymore. And we can ask what are the special values of i, i star, s, s star and r, r star that ensure this. For what values of s, i and r, what special values of s, i and r do the left hand sides vanish. So, that is easy to make out. For example, you can take the second equation set i times beta s minus gamma minus mu equal to 0, which can only happen if i star equal to 0 at that special value or if s star is gamma plus mu by beta, which is 1 by r 0. Once I have that, I can insert it into the other equation systematically and find that the special values of s, i and r at that fixed point s star, i star and r star are 1 by r naught mu by beta r naught minus 1 and 1 minus 1 by r naught minus mu by beta times r naught minus 1. If I switch the, death, the de birth and death rates to 0, setting mu equal to 0, this generates the standard long time behavior of the SIR model without demography, where S is 1, S star is 1 by R0, I star is 0, and R star is 1 minus 1 by R0. So, there are no infected at long time within the standard SIR model without demography. You need demographic input both in terms of births and death to stabilize a non zero value or making a disease endemic within the population, giving a non-zero value for the number of infected at long times. So, from here, the point that we made earlier was that you can characterize the disease and the spread of disease in a population by specifying R0. And R0 reflected two quantities. First of all, how many people contacted each other and how many, many of those contacts were effective in transferring disease from an infected person to a susceptible person. And there are how long the infected person stayed infected, because that determined how many contacts that person would have in that time interval. So, the beta is normally a contact per unit time. And if I multiply that by a time, which is the inverse of the gamma, then I will get the quantity beta divided by gamma, which is R0. So, really R0 refers to the number of cases that a single infected individual will propagate through the population. So, a large R0, for example, for measles of about 17 or 18 means that one infected individual will, in, will influence 18 members of the population who started off as susceptible. Okay. But if you wanted to estimate R0 from that, you can estimate it from the equation that we wrote down, which says that starting right to the beginning, you have an exponential increase in the number of infected. So, if you go back to that, to the way we derive those equations, we found that i was i naught times exponential of r naught minus 1, s times r naught minus 1, where s is the susceptible fraction. But the difficulty is that often the initial sets of cases in population are very noisy. Many cases may not be reported or they may be reported later. So, far from the smooth, nice graphs that we saw in the beginning when we looked at the solutions of the SIR model. These are inevitably very noisy. In fact, this is actually somewhat cleaner because it seems to show a more or less monotonic increase. But often, right at the beginning, you see uh, three cases, then no cases, then five cases, then no cases, then no cases, then seven cases, then two cases. And you see this, this sort of stochasticity in a given realization of how many people fell ill that dominates the behavior and very hard to fit a smooth function like an exponential to data like that. So, one must resort to various types of statistical techniques, 
or other methods for trying to understand the nature of R0 for a particular disease. Mm -hmm. And even there, remember that it is only S times R0 which we could estimate, but often S is not very well known because that is a septal fraction within the population. It is only for diseases that have never contacted the population before that you can set S equal to 1. But in general, you do not know that. You do not know where pre existing immunity exists, some earlier strain that was related to this and how that varies within the population. So, this is hard to estimate. So, one must try to find out other ways of doing this. So, what we discussed the last time was remember how we define the force of infection. So, the rate of change of the septables in the population is proportional to the number of septables, and the proportionality constant is called the force of infection and is beta times i. Remember S plus i plus r equal to 1. So, there is no factor of n that we have for the standard incidence. So, it is just beta appears in that equation. If you look at this equation ds by dt equal to minus lambda s, this describes an exponential solution, a solution that decays exponentially. So, the average time spent in the susceptible class before leaving the class, this is the number in the susceptible class, that is the inverse of that particular quantity beta i, the inverse of lambda, because lambda is an inverse time scale, 1 by lambda is a time scale. So, that gives me the average time spent in the susceptible class as 1 over beta times i star. So, from here we also know that R naught is beta times gamma plus mu. I can put that factor of beta back in and finally get I star to be mu by beta R naught minus 1 or mu by gamma plus mu 1 minus 1 by R 0. So, if I know I star, I can try and invert this to get R 0. So, let us just go a little one step further. So, this is how we started out with. We said tau equal to 1 by beta I star. We wrote I star in terms of R naught mu and gamma plus mu. But now let us look at the mean age of infection. That is, at so the mean age of infection can be calculated from here as 1 by mu times R naught minus 1. Okay. To this, you have to add the rate of leaving the R class. So people who have recovered and then later die, that gives that rate is mu, and the inverse of mu leads to a lifespan L. So dividing one quantity, the inverse of mu here, replacing that by L and putting the A here, you get an approximation for R naught minus 1, which is roughly the lifespan L divided by the mean age of infection. Okay. So, this says that if I know what is the mean age of infection, I know the lifetime of the people in the population. From here, I can, I can estimate R naught minus 1. So, here are three curves for different values of mu. 1 by mu is 40 years, 60 years and 80 years with R naught on the x axis. And depending upon the mean age of infection for each of these curves, given a mu is something that you can infer from a population in general that is roughly related to the death rate. So, from here you can read off the value of the reproductive ratio that corresponds to a particular death rate given the mean age of infection within a population. Okay. So, these are all clever ways of looking at population based data to try and extract numbers that are relevant. In this case, the number R naught. Another way of doing this is just to ask, has someone been exposed to a particular infection or not? Exposure leads to the production of antigens, antibody generators in your body. If you are seropositive, the term meaning that if antigens are present, either indicating that you are currently infectious or you are immune to the disease because you have contacted it earlier. If you are seronegative, then antigens are absent and you are naive to that particular infection. You have not contacted it before, therefore you have no antibodies in your system that can counteract it. What is done here is if you can measure the proportion of uninfected individuals in the population, that proportion is related to 1 by R0. Okay. Modulo a certain assumption. The assumption is that the all members of the population, like in the standard SIR model, are equally susceptible. However, that is not the case because it is known that seroprevalence increases as you are older, because at, at the older you are, the more chances there are of you having contacted that infection or something very close to it that gives you immunity to that particular case. So, that becomes a little more complicated. So, first of all, where did this, um, this S0, S equal to 1 by R0 come from? Remember that we started off with I times beta S minus gamma minus mu equal to 0. So, the I star equal to 0 or S star is gamma plus mu by beta, which is 1 by R0. Okay. So, in general, in the SIR model with births and deaths, you get endemic equilibrium when the fraction of susceptibles in the population is inverse of R naught. Okay. Or here is another example that in the endemic state, the number of infections, new infections and people moved from the infectious class must balance each other because then at that point I becomes independent of time. 
So in that case, r equal to 1, the effective reproductive ratio must be 1. This means that r, if you write r equal to r naught times x with x a fraction of susceptible at equilibrium, then the relationship between x, r equal to 1, x and r naught is just 1. Okay, This follows from x is just 1 by r naught, the same result that we derived earlier. Okay, so let's go back to the set of Plevron's result. And now here we use the age dependent nature of the likelihood of susceptibility. So remember that we wrote the mean age of infection to be 1 over mu times r naught minus 1. Okay, this was exponentially distributed. That means you could write the probability PA that a person is still susceptible at age A as an exponentially decaying function with the mean age of infection appearing in the denominator. Okay, so A is the A is an age. The probability PA is the probability that a person is still susceptible at age A. You know that this leads to a mean age of infection capital A which is given by this value. So that is already enough to tell you about what the probability distribution looks like. It is an exponential function with this particular quantity capital A appearing in it. So now one approaches this problem from a statistical point of view. Rather than work with a single curve which gave you the mean age of infection and the function of R0 to tell you find out where you were on that particular curve, imagine that you sample from this population. So you pick up a certain bunch of seronegative samples, sorry, this first word should have been <coughs> seropositive samples from individuals of ages A1, A2, A3, A4 and seronegative samples from individuals of ages B1, B2, B3, B4. So the probability of having, these are independent probabilities, so the probability of having an individual of age A1, A2, A3, A4 being seropositive is an exponential of with, where the age of that individual appears here and this is the average lifetime that appeared in the mean age of infection that appeared in the previous slide. So this is a set of probabilities for finding people who are seropositive at ages A1, A2, A3, A4, etc. This is multiplied by the probability of finding a person which is zero negative, which is 1 minus the other probability, which is 1 minus, so those ages are bj. So once I have that, this is a product to find the product of the probabilities, which is a likelihood of making that particular measurement where you have a certain number of A's who register seropositive and a certain number of B's who register seronegative. So now the question is, there is one parameter here which is R0. What is the best value of R0 that maximizes the likelihood? So having defined the likelihood function with one variable parameter which is R0, we can ask what is the R0 that best fits the data in which you have a certain number of people who register seropositive and a certain number of people who register seronegative. So from there you can estimate R0 by, by maximizing this likelihood and arrive at another independent estimate of R0 that is in a sense a little more closer to the truth because it takes population level data from, takes individuals from that population and sees how are they divided into seropositive and seronegative, what are the ages at which they are, um, at which they achieved that infection, puts it into a formula like this and then that's a statistical estimation of the quantity R0. Okay, this is again something that we discussed the last time. Let me just do it very fast. So we said these were the fixed points, S star, I star, R star. These are the points at which ds by dt, di by dt, dr by dt, all of them vanish. Now we can ask what is the stability of these points? If you move away from those points a little bit, introduce one more infected person into that population, you tend to move away from those points stay within them, move around them in some periodic manner, etc. So these questions are conventionally addressed by linearizing about these fixed points over here. And once you linearize, you can linearize in terms of the Jacobian, which is the derivative of the function f. So this is dni by dt, where n could be si or r, is fi, different functions for i, can one to i going from 1, 2, 3, that's the Jacobian. And the eigenvalues of the Jacobian can be calculated and they assume this particular form for lambda 1 and lambda 2 comma 3. Mm -hmm. So there is one approximation over here that has gone into this, actually a more complicated expression. This is a slightly simplified version, but what is important here is the combination of two eigenvalues which have complex paths, the plus minus complex path. They must always appear in complex conjugate terms because all the coefficients in the, in the equation that we wrote down here are positive. So once you do this, with this assumption, you can ask what is the nature of trajectories as you move away from that fixed point. So here is a fixed point here, here is a fixed point here, here is a fixed point here. And here is a classification of different types of trajectories here. This is the center and if you move away from here to this point, then you just keep moving around that. 
perfectly periodic manner. This is a stable node. So wherever you are, you tend to move back towards that particular point. A stable spiral is one that's even if you start off far away, you spiral in towards that particular point. And this is the example that is relevant to this particular case. Okay, because you always have a negative eigenvalue here, a negative real part to this eigenvalue, and a negative value here. So those fixed points are actually stable, but the approach is in a spiral manner as it comes closer and closer and closer to that particular point. And there are various other types of saddle points or stable nodes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is obvious from here. This is a calculation of the infectious fraction in a SIR model with demography as a function of time. And you can see these oscillations, but these oscillations don't go on forever. They're damped. So the amplitude comes down as you go as you go ahead in time. That suggests exactly that this picture that you calculated from here is appropriate. The picture here is appropriate. And therefore, the solutions, the, the approach to this particular to these fixed points is oscillatory with a decreasing amplitude as you go forward in time. Okay, so now having done that, we can ask how do we improve on these compartment models? So far we have been discussing a very simple model where we take a population, you put people into three buckets, the S bucket, the I bucket, and the R bucket. And the only variable that you consider is how many people are there in each bucket, and you look at changes in that particular number. So one way of doing this is just, as I said, adding complexity to each compartment, making each compartment many sub-compartments, which reflect one or the other feature that you want to try and capture. So each compartment could have certain subclasses that represent different risks for infection. They could be structured by age, with different ranges, ages for rates for infection for old and young people, or they could represent different distinct types of subpopulations. So age structured models, if you remember, is has to do with the discussion of childhood infections. If all children were born susceptible, ignoring deaths, then the rate at which the number of children changes is proportional to the contacts with the infectious people. If this is happening about an endemic equilibrium, you have a minus beta i star times c. So the initial number will c zero will decay in time, according to exponential minus beta i star times t, which you can write in terms of r naught minus one and the alpha and beta term that I wrote down earlier. So the number of susceptible children left decays exponentially as they grow older, and the decay rate is proportional to R0. So large R0 represents childhood diseases, for example, measles. So it's important to remember that these are not intrinsic to childhood. They're not things that specifically attack children. It's just that they're sufficiently infectious that they tend to get caught early in life. And once they get caught early in life, then they sort of they stay, they provide immunity for later infections. Although, so although these are not, so this is an important point. Although we tend to think of these as diseases that affect children, they're not specific to children. It's just that children, the R zeros are large, so children tend to catch them and move out of the child compartment and move into the infected compartment much earlier on. But for various reasons, it's even though it's true that any individual in the population has an equal probability of catching it, it's sometimes advantages to take to represent this by just taking into account children as a separate population, as a separate compartment and dealing with that. Okay. So this would be the example of the age structured model with NC, the population, the proportion of the population that are children. And the dynamics come from birth, since all children are born susceptible to disregard maternal immunity. These come from infections. So they, f they contact illness through infections, either from infected adults or infected children. But the rates are different. Because children, contacting children, typically happens at a larger probability, for example, at schools or daycares. So we should account for the difference in this particular structure here. You lose children through the adult class through aging, but you can ignore mortality for most of what is required here. So these are the equations that you would write down. This is susceptible children, infected children, susceptible adults, infected adults. The term to note there is the term that reflects the force of infection. So there is a beta times CA, that is beta times adult to child times infectious, the proportion of infectious adults. And there's a beta for child to child times the proportion of infected children. And the other terms are the loss term that come from children becoming adults, the birth term that coming from newborn children, etc., and relative balance term that reflect the fact that if you lose from the children compartment because children become adults, then you sort of gain in the adult compartments. So there must be a compensating factor that accounts for that. So now, instead of having a simple beta, you have beta with multiple indices. And you have, it's now a matrix of values that represents how you mix between the age classes. How do adults infect children? How do children infect adults? How do children infect children? How do adults infect adults? So the structure of a beta term like this, which really reflects 
the nature of who you contact an infection with is sometimes written as WAIFW, who acquires infection from whom. So, the specification of the beta, of the numbers in that beta matrix is really a specification of who acquires infection from whom and with what particular strength. And over here, if you look at the number, the childhood class is from 0 to AC, which is 1 by L, the age at the mean age at which infection is acquired. Okay, so beta is now a matrix of values. You need to weight the R zeros according to the level of exposure within that class. You can still apply the old ideas that we used regarding vaccinations, but often the threshold is much higher than if you ignore the age structure because of the propensity of children to interact with different betas with children as with adults here. But knowing this is also important because then you know which are the populations you should target for vaccine function success. So, once you understand who acquires infection from whom, you understand the structure of the beta matrix, you understand what are the important components that lead to infections within children. You can then preferentially infect those adults in close contact with children, immunize those adults in close contact with children, other groups of cohorts or groups of children, and thus acquire a better control over the disease than just immunizing the whole population. Okay, so here is one more generalization of this whole business of taking compartments and making them more interesting, and that is in terms of a meta population. So, in the SIR model, we typically consider one large population. We allow every individual there to contact every other individual with equal rate. But often, it is interesting to consider the situation where you have multiple populations that are connected somewhat weakly. For example, a person could travel from one population to the other. Here is one example in this particular picture of population 1, population 2, population 3, population 4. These are also called patch models, which you can see from the way they are represented graphically. There is a patch here and a patch here and a patch here. And you can have, for example, a city here, a route here, a forest here, a bridge there, etc. And all contacts between these are contacts that are relatively smaller. So, on the whole, Individuals in population 4 tend to stay in population 4, individuals in population 3 tend to stay in population 3, but there may be weak contacts with, between each other. For example, if one individual goes here and comes back, then they may contact each other. Okay? So, the, each of these populations are big enough that you can apply the deterministic SIR model to each of these. You do not have to worry about stochastics at the first level, but you must account for the fact of mixing or the fact that you can infect that someone from here can infect someone from there and so on. Okay? So, they interact as individual members move from one population to the other. So, the sort of equation that you would write down, for example, this is susceptibles in population i. So, now you would have susceptibles in population 1, population 2, population 3, population 4, which you will index by this index i, as well as infectives in, in population i. So, the structure of these equations is that dx by dt is some birth term mu i minus lambda i times x i, that is a sort of depart departure term from there. And there is a mu i, which is again a death term. Okay? And similarly, there is a dyi by dt, which is lambda i times xi minus gamma i times y minus mu i times y. And the lambda i's are the forces of infection. So, they are what couple populations to each other. So, there is a rho i. So, this is lambda i, that is a force of infection influencing susceptibles in population i, is beta i reflecting that infection, times a rho i j, which tells you how i and j are connected, times the number of infected in population J. So, that is susceptible in population I, infective in population I, both that is why this I index is there. But it is this lambda I term that couples different populations and makes this whole discussion somewhat lambda. So, what is done here is to take the force of infection in patch I to be a weighted sum over the numbers of infected in the other patches. So, now the question comes, so what is the best way to think about this rho I J? How do you model the connection between populations? What is the understanding or the epidemiological understanding? that goes into that particular model. So, here is an example of a population where you have SIR over there, SIR over there, SIR over there, and you have these connections between these are the rho ij connections that tells you how much a population k influences, influences a population i through the connection here. So, if you, you can look at simple solutions of these. For example, if you take S1 and S2 to be close to 1, 1 minus epsilon, you take rho i i equal to 1. So, you look at the strongest connections within a particular population, but rho i j, where i and j are different and connect to, are much smaller than 1. When you start off with infection initially in 1, you ask what happens to the population in 2. So, if you look at these equations, there is a term that involves 
simply I2. So, this is the beta times I2 population within infections within I2. The second term is people leaving I2 and the first term there is infections caused by people in I1 through the row 2 T1 term with, with strength beta. If you can take this and now solve it, if you with the assumption that the, in, that the infection is initially in 1 and, and I2 is actually very small, you can take these equations, write it in terms of I1s and this exponential kernel here is what tells you there is an exponentially increasing growth in population 2 because of the connection between population 2 and 1. Okay. So, even though you started off with the infection in population 1, just the fact of this rho ij written in this particular form here could give you a structure in which you have an exponentially increasing infection in population 2. So, that is even weak connection between population can give you, you can seed infections in other population by starting them off at one particular point. So, I said that the rho ij is the important factor because that is what we have not specified here and that tells you how i and j populations are connected. So, in what ways can they be connected? First of all, if they are spatially very far away, it is unlikely that you will have regular mixing between these populations. So, this rho i j typically can be written as a function of the distance between i and j and the precise choice of that distance of that function governing that distance is sometimes given by something called a gravity model that says that the decays as a power law of the distance between these the distance separating these two populations. You can also account for migrations or permanent migrations as people moving permanently from population 2 to population 1. So, these are terms the Mij's for example, are the rates at which hosts migrate to population from population migration to population i from j. Okay. So, that is what Mij is so j to i. Okay. So, these are again the sort of equations that you would write on which are standard gain and loss terms by which population i gains at the um, at the expense of population j due to in migration from j. So, that is a term here. So, x j is the population in j and that m i j is the migration term that says I lose from j and I add that term to i. And these are again equations for the susceptibles in i and infecteds in i and we must write down equations like this for each of the populations that we have. There are there are an additional source of the rho i j s and that comes from rapid commute, commuter movements. For example, if I stay in one city like Pune and I want to work in Bombay, that is a commuting type of relationship that I have. I sit in a vehicle, I move there, I go there, I reach after two and a half hours and then I come back in the evening. So, this is different from a migration. A migration is something in which people move bodily and then they are associated with the new population. Their numbers of the new population increase. This is only a short term increase that it uh, goes up in the morning and but it comes down in the evening. So, with the separation of time scales implies that you can average over commuter movements in some way and you can write the lambda i's in terms of beta i's and some function that represents fraction of commuter movements from i from population j to i. You can write it in the form, the details are not particularly important, but essentially they reflect the proportion of time that individuals spend away from home when they move from population to population. And the reason you can average this as I said is because the separation of time scales involved in rapid commuter movements going back and forth. You can just represent this in terms of the average amount of time spent there versus the average amount of time that you spend here. Okay. All right. So, that is a sort of quick discussion of what we had to tie up in compartment models and the simple compartment models and a few generalizations of them that really refer to adding more compartments. You can think of metapopulation models as having a bunch of different compartmental models that are coupled in some way. You could complicate the discussion of each compartment, but now let us just do different things and ask what are the other effects of, comp of making the SIR model and models like it a little more complicated. What have we left out in our discussion? Okay. So, first of all, the SIR model is a deterministic model. Once I specify the initial values of S, I and R, the equations will tell me exactly what value I should get at some later time t. Okay. So, there is no fluctuation in that. If I run the computer program once more, it gives me exactly the same answer. But if numbers are small, especially in a real population, not at the level of these equations that we have written down, you have you can even have infections dying out completely because in the time that the person remained infectious and capable of transferring an infection, he or she may not have encountered another separate individual to whom to pass that infection to. So, these stochastic effects that which I, an infection can grow, not grow, the numbers by which it grow can fluctuate. This is important especially in small populations. 
The SIR model has no spatial information at all. It doesn't tell you where people are getting sick. Are there hotspots of infection? If you take a large city, is it more peripheral areas of the city that are affected? Is it sort of lower income areas of the city that are affected? Is it migrant population that are affected who tend to stay in certain areas? So there is no spatial information. You can ask, how do you put this into an SIR model? What sense would it make? Is it in a simple SIR model that you should put it or in a more complicated generalization of the model? Finally, this is a coarse-grained approach and you put all the members of the population into one of three compartments. You don't allow for any variation that is individual, that reflects an individual changes in susceptibility between individual and individual, reflecting their age, reflecting their prior exposure, reflecting their health status, etc. Finally, the all-to-all -all interaction that is, that is assumed, the fact that any individual can interact with any other individual, is certainly a gross simplification and network and spatial effects are important. Let me just check this. Where is the screen projection? Sorry. So, did you see the slide at all? Was it shown? Okay. So, the last is the all to all interaction, which is uh, certainly a gross simplification. You need network effects, you need spatial effects to be accounted for. So, here is an example of how random effects depend upon population size. So if the population size is large enough, the probability of fade out of uh, initially a case in time going dropping to 0. So, this is an interesting example. So, the horizontal axis is the population size, and each point there is a particular city or a certain community here. And what is shown in the vertical axis is the fraction of is the fraction of months in each sample with no reported cases of measles. Okay. So the fact that this number is large here means that a population of this particular size between 10 to the 3 and 10 to the 4 individuals had a large fraction of the time in which no cases were of measles were reported at all. As you go forward in, in, in population, if you increase population size 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, can see these numbers come down. That means that the larger you make your population, the fraction of months which go without a reported case of measles drops. Beyond the point, a certain critical population size which you could estimate somewhere between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 6, there are no months in which you do not report a case of measles. That suggests that there may be a critical population size above which stochastic effects because these, whether you have a case or not, is really a stochastic effect in reported in a particular population, become unimportant. And then presumably the SIR model uh, that we have written down as general form will actually function. Whereas the moment you have to look at smaller populations here, you have to worry a lot about stochastic effects and how to model them in that particular population. Okay. So let's begin to discuss stochastic effects. And sort of look at a little bit of the mathematics behind that and what determines it. So, as I said, we're going to think about compartments. So, imagine you have particles that move between compartments, transition between compartments. Think of just one compartment. Mm -hmm. So, X of t, for example, we're not talking about the SIR model anymore, but you could X of t you could think of as representing the number of particles in that particular compartment, and particles enter at random times. The rule is the probability of in a time delta t of the number of particles in that box changing by 1 is some lambda times delta t. The larger the delta t, the larger the probability of that event happening. I will take delta t to be small in order to take the right limit in which delta t goes to 0. But lambda represents a rate at which particles are added, where rate is a number per unit time. Okay. So, the real assumption here is the probability of the number changing in a particular time delta t is proportional to that interval delta t. As delta t vanishes, there is no probability at all. The larger delta t, the more the probability that an event will happen. Okay, so similarly, the probability that nothing happens, that there are no particles that enter the box in a little time interval delta t is 1 minus lambda delta t, because these probabilities must add up to 1. Either a particle enters or no particle enters. So this particular way of specifying how x of t changes in time it's called a Poisson process. And the reason for this is that increments and disjoint time intervals are independent of each other. This is also called a Markov jump process. 
because the value of x i jumps from one value to the other. It does not take continuous values in between. So, each jump is independent. Each jump takes you from n to n plus 1 to n plus 2 to n plus 3 if you're considering only adding towards a particular box. So here are some basic facts about Poisson processes that events are independent in Poisson processes and there is some quantity rho called the rate of occurrence or intensity of the process. The word intensity is used often in the, in the stochastics literature. This is the same as the lambda that I wrote the last time. So the probability that there is one event in the interval t and t plus delta t is rho times dt plus higher order terms in dt, so dt squared, dt cubed, etc., etc., which are smaller in a precise mathematical sense than the leading order term rho times dt. Similarly, the probability that there is no event in t and t plus dt is 1 minus rho dt. Again, this is just a conservation of probability. The probability that there are two events in an infinitesimal amount of time dt is basically a higher order in dt, dt squared, dt cubed, etc., etc. So to lowest order, you can neglect this. And these two terms are the terms that are actually important. Okay, so notation O D T means some quantity that tends to zero faster than D T as D T goes to zero. These events are independent in different time intervals. So that in this time interval here, this time interval here, this time interval here are completely independent of each other. You could have one event, no event, no event, no event, one event, etc. And that would be would have the same probability as something like one event, one event, one event, no event, etc., etc., etc. Okay. So the distribution of the number of events in t and t plus h is in t where h is not dt but some finite time interval is Poisson with mean rho times h. So that is a single quantity that characterizes, rho is a single quantity that characterizes the Poisson process and rho times and time interval t, total time interval t which is rho, which written as h here, the number of events that you expect is rho times that h, where rho is the expected number of events per unit time. So the time between the events is exponentially distributed. It has a mean 1 by rho. If there are independent Poisson processes with two rates, rho and mu, then the sum of these is also Poisson. The total rate is rho plus mu. Okay. So now you have one compartment. This is what we wrote down earlier. You had particles entering, but you could also make this depend upon x of t. So for example, if you looked at the probability that x at t plus delta t minus x of t equal to 1, that is the probability that you have increased the number in that particular box in the interval time in the interval dt between t and t plus dt. This could also be brought to x of t with some constant outside times the dt and then higher order terms which we will then neglect. So a of x t is called the conditional instantaneous stochastic rate of the process at time t. And it's conditional because it's conditioned on the value of x t. x of t appears explicitly in that particular number. And the rate, because the rate is a times x of t, it's conditioned on the value of x of t. This is a pure birth process because we are only adding particles to this particular box. And we also know that a Markov jump process has exponentially distributed time between the jumps. But you could also have deaths in this module. You could have stuff added, stuff leaving as well, the same as particles leaving the compartment. You could have more compartments with arrows between them leading in and out. For example, if you looked at the SIR model, which is really saying, take something from here, put it there, take something from here, put it here, remove it, add it, etc. Et so all of these have the same interpretation in terms of the adding and the removing of particles conditioned on various quantities that we prescribe. For example, the rate at which an infected, a susceptible individual becomes infected is conditioned on the rate, on the number of infected individuals already present. Okay. So an epidemical, epidemic compartmental model is some vector value process, that is it has multiple components, S, I, and R, with a vector component for each compartment. There are several types of jumps, which is if you drew, drew arrows between the S, I, and R compartments, you could have one type of jump for each arrow in the diagram. If the resulting process is Markov, then each type of jump occurs according to a local Poisson probability. You know how they are exponentially distributed in terms of the states that exist at the beginning of the interval. Each of these you can regard as a birth or death process where you take something from here and put something there with specified rates, with instantaneous rates that depend on the components. The restriction that you must have exponentially distributed inter jump times is not too restrictive. If you have more stages, each of them are independent of each other, and this results in a more complex distribution called a gamma distribution. What's really important is that the conditional mean for each increment, that is a change between t and delta t relates to the conditional variance of the income because for Poisson processes the mean variance are tied to each other. Okay, so that's really the sort of core understanding behind these models. 
So this is enough to yield a Markov structure in which the mean and variance of the process are equal to each other. So let's go back to the SIR model and look at what happens in a time interval delta t. That's all of the stuff that can happen. So as we said for taking, adding and removing particles from particular compartment, here now we want to look at the probability that that s at time t plus delta t, i at time t plus delta t minus s at time t at uh, i t is minus 1 and 1. That means you have removed from the susceptible compartment and added to the infective compartment. So this is the rate on the right hand side. That's the rate that we wrote down earlier, the beta factor s at time t, i at time t divided by n times the delta t. And the delta t is, so this is the rate times the time interval, infinitesimal time interval delta t. Similarly, the probability that this differs, that the s and i at time t plus delta t differ from s and i at time t. This is 0, 0,1, which means I have removed from the infected compartment. That is a gamma term over there. That is it, is that correct? Uh, should that have been a negative sign or a positive sign? Okay, we can figure that out. You can just write it down in terms of whatever it ought to be there. So again, the probability that nothing happens in the time delta t is 1 minus the probability that the combination of probability that I had written down there. So this is um, yeah, okay, we can solve that. This is called the general stochastic epidemic because now I have written the changes in s and i across infinitesimal time intervals in terms of a set of rates on the right hand side. So now you can write down all the rates with the demography. You, you have you lead into the S compartment at some rate mu times capital N, you remove from at, at, from the S compartment at rate mu times S. You have various rates of transition between compartments. So if you ask what is the rate at which the transition from S to S plus 1 happens in time delta T, that is mu times N. That is the birth rate. Mu is the birth rate per unit population. My N is the total number that are added to that. Okay. S to S minus 1 happens at rate beta times SI by N times delta T plus mu times N. And all of these, the, the delta T actually multiplies all of these particular terms. This is written a little carelessly there. So then you have I to I plus 1, I to I minus 1, R to R plus 1, R to R minus 1. All of these rates can be written down. And these represent the rates at which all of the possible events in your population can actually happen. So the deterministic limit is the standard SIR model or generalization thereof. So if you take these equations here, for P, for P and P here, the total sort of conservation of probability equation for all of the stuff that can actually happen, you take it and you write it in this form. You can compute the expected value of the increment by just averaging over these probabilities. So the expected value of the increment here is just the mu times n minus st minus beta st i t by n times delta t plus delta z1 plus delta z2, where delta z1 and delta z2 are Poisson increments that are. So these are the two random paths of this change here. So you have divided the change in S in infinitesimal amount of time delta t into some part of it that is not random, sorry, that is not random. And to that you have added a Poisson process with certain mean and variance. Okay. By removing, by averaging over these last two terms here, you can get back to the original SIR equation. So you drop the Poisson term, you divide it by delta t, and you get back to the deterministic SIR equation that I wrote down. You can account for these additional terms in another way. You can represent them as Brownian term, effectively getting a diffusion equation in the space of SIR and T, which is a diffusion equation approximation to the Markov process. These look like the SIR equations with certain types of noise terms. This is a little more technical from a mathematical point of view, so we won't describe it here, but just to tell you that this is how it's actually done in practice. So you start with a deterministic model. You start with a completely stochastic model in which you represent rates in the form that I have done. This is a Markov process where the increments are given by some Poisson distribution. You can take that and write in the large, in the limit of large n, where you can ignore stochasticity. These equations are go back to the original equations that you wrote down, from which you got these rates in the first place. And those are the standard SIR equations. 
but you can think of those SI equations with stochasticity, either in terms of adding specific noise terms to the right hand side, or you can work with the fully stochastic version in which you actually look at the changes in numbers between n, n plus 1, n plus 2 in each of these compartments. Okay. One way of studying this numerically is by using something called an event driven algorithm or the Gillespie method. And that just amounts to sort of writing all of the things that can happen and writing down the rate at which each of those things happen. For example, s goes to s plus 1 represents some births at rate mu times n. Transmission at rate beta times i a times s by n is s going to s minus 1. Number of susceptibilities goes down by 1. Number of infectives goes up by 1. You recover at rate gamma times i. So i goes to i minus 1, r goes to r plus 1. Deaths of s at rate mu s is s going to s minus 1. So you have all of the rates on the left hand side, all of the events that can possibly happen on the right hand side. Okay? So the Gillespie method really functions by asking two questions. The first question is when does the next event occur? And the second question is which is the event that occurs next? So for this, we have to take a hint from the fact that we know that the time to the next event is exponentially distributed and that these are all independent Poisson processes that so you can add the rate. So the rate is equal to the sum over all rates of overall possible events that can happen at that particular time interval. So you can generate this by certain probability distribution function f of tau that represents the possibility of something happening, of an event happening at time tau. Okay? So which event occurs? You can convert these event rates into probabilities by, defining, by multiplying them by time. And you select one proportional to its weight. So you write the probability that a particular event V is chosen is the rate V divided by the sum over all the rates of all possible events that can actually happen. So there are these two paths, writing the probability F of tau for a particular event, finding out which. Then the second step is finding out which. The first step is to finding out how long it takes for the next event. The second step is to find out which event happens next. Okay. So the rules, the, the sort of practical implementation will be to set the initial population numbers, start at t equal to 0, so you start your clock. Then you calculate the rates of events that can happen from that particular point. You choose the tau from an exponential distribution with the parameter sum over ai, where ai is the possible rates that can happen. You choose which event can happen by splitting up those rates using a random number and seeing if the rate is large, then there is proportionately larger chance for that particular event to be chosen. You change the number of individuals to reflect the event and then update your time. Okay. And then you go back and you repeat all of this again. So central to this is a question of how do you draw from a particular distribution. So let's spend a few minutes on that just prior to winding up. So suppose I have a simple distribution. This is just the distribution of a number between 0 and 1 that is uniform. So this says that the probability, so the y-axis is, is, is the probability of finding a value of x in an inferenceable interval dx about x. And this is basically constant for x between 0 and 1. So there is no probability of finding an x value anywhere here. There is no probability of finding an x value greater than 1. But the probability of finding an x value anywhere between 0 and 1 is a constant. And this is appropriately normalized. So if I ask the question, what is the probability of finding an x value anywhere between 0 and 1? That would be 1. Okay. From here, I can get the cumulative distribution function, which is just says, what is the probability of finding a value of x less than the particular value that I have chosen? Okay. So that is basically looking at the area of the curve between here and here, here and here, here and here, etc. With this very simple form of the probability, that just becomes a linear expression. So this is the, the cumulative distribution function p of x, which is 0 up till here, rises in linearly to 1, and then saturates at 1 after that. Okay. So the method that is used to find, to draw from a particular probability distribution in this case is called the inverse transform sampling. So I'll just explain where that comes from. So I can do this for even a more complicated distribution function. Suppose I had a probability distribution function that is some combination of a distribution function that is constant in some interval here. Of, so I have a constant probability of finding anything between 0 and 0 0.5. Any of these values are equivalent to each other. And there is another peak somewhere else centered about 1.5. I can choose whatever probability distribution I want to make a point. All that matters is the P of x. The probability distribution should be greater than or equal to 0 and it should integrate to 1. And this particular choice satisfies that. So it's a legitimate probability distribution. Okay. 
I by I can take the cumulative distribution function from here just by integrating. So, I know that this part of it should generate a straight line up to about 0 0.5, then there is no probability here. So, that straight line remains a constant until I reach this particular point here where this Gaussian or whatever it is begins to pick up and then I have a function that increases and finally saturates to 1. So, the cumulative distribution function always starts at 0, always ends at 1 and the range is the range over which you want your, your, prob your probabilities are calculated, the range that is appropriate to the calculation of those probabilities. So, what is done here is to take this and essentially interchange the x and the y axis, all right. To def this defines inverse function of the probability. So, if I take p of y versus y, the cumulative distribution function, invert the axis so that y appears there and this I will now label as x. So, essentially I have for any x here, I have an inverse function that is calculated on any of those y points. So, the logic is if x is some random variable distributed according to some cumulative distribution function f. If I want to generate values of x distributed according to this distribution, I do it in the following way. I first generate a random number from a standard uniform distribution in the interval 0, 1. That is easy for me to do because any computer algebra system, any computer computer system will make me do that. From here, I compute the value of x such that I, I start off with you. I compute the value here such that f of u, f of x is u, this particular value there. So, x is the random number drawn from the distribution f, okay. So, essentially this, if you wanted to apply this to the case that we are considering the exponential distribution, if x is an exponentially distributed random variable, the cumulative distribution function f x of x is 1 minus exponential minus lambda x. At x equal to 0, this is 0 at x equal to infinity, that term is f of x is 1. So, it is a legitimate uh, probability distribution function. And the inverse of that function is minus 1 by lambda log of 1 minus u. So, here I have plotted f of x. Over here, now I am just interchanging the x and the y axis. These are values between 0 and 1 for y. So, if you look at this, if you generate a random number y from uniform distribution between 0 and 1, that is uniformly distributed across this interval. You can map each point according to x equal to f inverse of y. So, that implies for this point here that maps here, for this point here that maps here. Mm -hmm. So, these are shown with gray arrow, arrows for two example points. There are many more points close to the origin here as opposed to a relatively few points far away from the origin. That just reflects the shape of the curve and the large density that you assume in the, when this curve comes in towards the origin there. So, that recovers for you the exponential distribution. So, this is just a graphical way of seeing how you use this inverse transform method in order to move between two probability distributions. Then it's a general idea that you can use to change between any set of probability distribution that you actually want. I can now take this algorithm. Remember that I specified what the algorithm was when I wrote this equation here. So, this is set the initial population numbers for S, I and R, update them reflecting the infection, etc., etc. But now, because there is this element of stochasticity, I start off by sampling from an exponential probability distribution. As I run my program again and again and again, I will generate different sequences of random numbers. Therefore, the increase and the decrease of the epidemic will be different in each case. So, here is an example of how different it is. So, here are 10 stochastic SIR model realizations. So, this is a plot of the number of infected individuals as a function of time. You can see this rise up and come down, but each curve is not the same. If I generated this an infinite number of possible curves and looked at the average of all of these, that should give me the curve that the SIR model would actually generate because I have essentially removed stochasticity by doing an infinite average and looking only at the mean. But you can see that any single realization of this shows a lot more structure and a lot more variation than the SIR model would actually have indicated. Okay, So, this is something that is sort of understandable very clearly where it comes from and this the, the Gillespie method is a powerful way of actually implementing this calculation and checking it. The SIR model is a very simple reduction of the true complexity, the stochastic complexity of this excluding all of the other sources of complexity into a form that can be studied and almost analytically solved you know, for most of its important properties. But ultimately, we should not forget that nature itself is stochastic, the nature of infection is stochastic.
And so we would like to learn a little more about stochastic models, how one can implement them better, put in space, put in more, more of the details that are that are potentially relevant to the study of epidemics. And we'll try and do that in the next few classes. Okay. So thanks.